This series of sermons has its end this week. Feel free to clap. Uh, Psalm 52, 53, and 54. Like in our hymnal, these hymns are sometimes grouped because of thematic commonalities. Psalms about justice in this place. These three psalms actually sound quite a bit alike. Perhaps that's sometimes why you don't read the psalms. It's difficult at first reading to distinguish them from one another. But these three intentionally fit the same pattern, where the first truth is early and the second truth the middle and, of course, the third truth at the end. But the first of these psalms emphasizes the first of these truths and the second of them, that middle one, and now this third one, Psalm 54, the last of the three truths, it lingers on a bit longer, allowing us to do the same. These sermons are leading up to a series of events, the first one of which was during the midtime hour when nearly a hundred of us gathered in the West Room to hear Michelle Shoemaker from Point Loma Nazarene Center for Justice and Reconciliation offer us the work of justice and of God's people in the area of anti-human trafficking, sex trafficking in particular here in San Diego County. I know, I know that there's an ick factor even to the subject, I, I know that. And this is not why you came to church, but we, we follow Jesus. We don't blink at these things and we don't turn our eyes away. So we are grateful for her leadership. This coming Saturday night, she will be preaching at Jazz Vespers and we will be able to hear more about God's call for justice from his people. In the morning, a week from today, Kane Christie will be preaching at both services here in the sanctuary. Kane is the field director of the Ghanaian Office for International Justice Mission. And this is about anti-human trafficking, labor tra trafficking of boys away from their village and into the fishing industry where great harm and violence comes to them. Both Michelle and Kane are partners in the justice mission of this church and for some time. I have been in Ghana with Kane at the lake um, and I have been with him a couple places here in the States as well and we are very grateful that he's able to come and spend the day with us. He'll also lead us in the adult education hour during the time between the two worship services and a luncheon after. More information about that is available on our website and we encourage you to come. Again, these sermons help prepare that and are a part of that. So too is this video from International Justice Mission.
We'll be participating in Freedom Sunday next week on September 17th instead because that's the week end that Cain could be with us and we are grateful for it. Let us pray. Your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. The entrance of your light brings light. Even in this moment, O oh Lord, by your word, let your light shine that we may follow and so live. Amen. Psalm 54. Save me, O oh God, by your name. Vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. Arrogant foes are attacking me. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. People without regard for God. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Let evil recoil on those who slander me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, Lord, for it is good. You have delivered me from all my troubles. And my eyes have looked in triumph on my foes. This is the word of the Lord. The ancient scribes that passed on the Bible to us did us a great service when they wrote, and yeah, added, brief one-line introductions to the Psalms. They tell us that the Psalm being read or sung is associated with a particular time in David's life. They and we have so many psalms from David and so many stories of his life that making connections was almost always possible. While it is possible to imagine that David did indeed write particular psalms in response to particular incidents, or maybe even some of them because of specific moments, we're not obligated to imagine that this real-life person is experiencing life through journaling only. The Bible paints such a clear picture of the extreme, real highs and lows that we are not permitted to imagine David fighting and fleeing for his life, quill and scroll in hand, more often sword. The gift given to us by these scribes is the permission to connect these words of God, which is the word of God, these psalms, with specific seasons and memorable moments in our lives also. The ancient scribes connect these wonderful words of Psalm 54 with a very specific and vivid story that's now recorded for us in 1 Samuel. They say simply at the top of the psalm, when the Ziphites went and told Saul, David is hiding among us. In this story, Saul is king and doing a very poor job of it, expending his time on what most ancient kings and modern power brokers do, eliminating their rivals. David is the king's servant, and, doing so, and in doing so is doing a heroic job of it. No king in Israel's history will have such a loyal or competent servant as David was to Saul. Saul is jealous of David threatens David's life, and in his paranoia becomes consumed with killing David. He neglects the defense of the kingdom against real enemies and squanders his stewardship of the well-being of the people of God. Saul, with 3,000 specially selected men of his army, begins a long pursuit of David. They go wherever the rumors of David's whereabouts lead him. Saul has to select these men from his army because he knows some in his army prefer the bold and brave David. He actually fights the enemies of the people of God. And Saul needs to rely on rumor of David's whereabouts because the people prefer the shepherd boy, now king in waiting, and cleverly obfuscate David's movements, hiding him from Saul. And as if to crush whatever self-respect Saul might have left. Saul's son, Jonathan, the prince next in line, acknowledges that God prefers David. That God will make David the next king 
indeed, that God has already anointed David. At the beginning of this particular story, in an important aside, Jonathan will tell David that Saul, his father, knows all this too. Out of a long and loving friendship with David, Jonathan goes to David in hiding to help David find strength. Jonathan and David covenant in these extreme circumstances. Neither will ever break the covenant. But the Ziphites will. They will betray David. The Ziphites are distant relatives, the kind of relatives you want to keep at a distance. They go to Saul with information of David's whereabouts. They go is the important phrase. This is not information extracted under duress or reluctantly given when required by the king. This is willful and willing betrayal. He is among us, they say. And they go on to provide very specific directions. South of this village, on that hill, in those strongholds. Go get them, they say to Saul. We'll hand them over to you, they promise. Saul, now sounding like King Herod, trying to eliminate his rival centuries later, the infant Jesus in Bethlehem, descendant of David, commissions the Ziphites. You go and bring me back intelligence on where I may find him. Who has seen him with her own eyes, his daily comings and goings, and every hiding place he has ever used. He's crafty, says Saul. David hears of this, is it from someone in Saul's command? And flees to the nearby wilderness desert, hurrying, the Bible says. Saul pursues Saul gets close. David is running and is now running out of room. David is going around one side of the mountain. The Bible is very specific. Saul is circling with his 3,000 around the other side of the mountain. The flight and the pursuit are about to conclude. Capture was next, says the Bible. Then, then, as Saul and his forces are closing in, the Bible says, word comes at that very moment that the Philistines are raiding back home. Actually, the Philistines are always raiding back home. This is what makes them Philistines. So this army of 3,000 trained men breaks off its pursuit of David. Perhaps gladly. Was their heart ever in it? and they go to meet the Philistines. In the fight with the Philistines, it's easier to tell the good guys from the bad guys. That makes the fight worth it. They depart, the Bible says emphatically. The Bible writer who records this story adds, and that's why we call this spot on this mountain the rock of departure, for the pursuit was broken on this rock. David writes of this time in the opening lines of Psalm 54. Save me, O God. A more composed prayer by a Presbyterian, no doubt, would say something like, O God, save me, in that order. Like the composed prayers of our worship, which address God first. Almighty God, loving Father, merciful Lord, gracious Jesus but David is not composed. He's desperate. Save me, he cries. Oh God, he remembers to add. Hear me, listen to me, he pleads. Then the complaint of trouble begins. Arrogant foes are attacking me. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. Let evil recoil on those who speak against me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. Injustice has come, and David names it. Evil in the common forms of slander and violence has prompted the prayer. There is no suggestion here that David casually remembered the fear of that day 
and years later calmly composed a few verses. Evil is present, a clear and present danger. The cry is immediate. Psalm 52 of two weeks ago allowed us to linger on this first truth. There is evil. There are evil ones. There is injustice. There are unjust ones. Our neighbors are slandered, their goods coveted, their property stolen, their relationships undermined, their reputations destroyed, their lives taken away from them by someone. Someone's. The human heart, the Bible tells us repeatedly, is wicked. It schemes and plots, deceives and destroys, lays ambushes, harms and hurts. Who knows the depths of its evil, the Bible says? Who can even speak of it? An often repeated pattern of the Psalms and of our prayers, I'm now recommending this to you, is the straightforward acknowledgement of injustice. Let it be early, if not first, in your prayers. Let the sustained and specific injustice of the human heart and the patterned and particular injustice of human society prompt your praying. Let the Psalms be your model. Let the Psalms give you your words. Psalm 53 of one week ago allowed us to linger on a second truth. There is a God, the just one, the only just one. Fools don't know this. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, says this psalm. This knowledge of the justice of God distinguishes not only the foolish from the wise, but the unjust from the just. We are the people who live knowing we have escaped the wrath of this just God. Fools are those who die thinking they have escaped God. I'll say that again. We are the people who live knowing and with great gratitude that we have escaped the wrath of this just God. Fools are those who die thinking they have escaped God. We know there is no justice without judgment, not fearing the latter, the former never desire, the fool never desires the former. Accountability is the issue. The ever-present injustice is the illustration. Their mockery of our trust in God is the constant complaint of the psalmist. The just one, God, in this psalm, David says, is my help. That's a title. Surely God is my help. Put capitals on it. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Help is a rarely used word in the Hebrew Bible. It first refers in the Bible to Eve, the helpmeet helpmate of Adam. No other being in all of creation is so much for him as her. There is no replacement. These two are made for each other. They match. They match in all the trials and tribulations of life. The only other referent in the Bible to a helpmeet, a helpmate, is to the Lord God Almighty. This God is the helper of those under attack in need of defense, wrongly accused in need of vindication, betrayed in need of an ally, one on the run in need of rest, the vulnerable in need of rescue. This is God, our God, my God, my help. David knows this. This God is just. Let their evil recoil on them. One day in the not too distant future, Saul, who had surrounded David with a superior fighting force and went in for the kill on that day, will find himself surrounded by Philistines. 
he will not escape. The Ziphites will betray David once again, the Bible will tell us, in order again to get into the good graces of the king, Saul. But it is David who will soon be king. They, it is presumed, spent the remainder of their days in hiding. We do not hear of them again. Justice and judgment of a just God. This third and last psalm allows us to linger on the third truth. In the presence of our enemies, our God saves. We, no matter how toxic the evil aimed at us, or sustained and systemic the justice around us, never finally identify ourselves as victims. We are the saved. That may not only be the final move, it is the first reality. We are the saved ones. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you, says David. I will praise your name, Lord, for it is good. And we know at the last we will sing with David. You have delivered me from all my troubles, and my eyes have looked in triumph on my foes. We do not live lives of fear, but of gratitude. Our world is not fashioned by the unjust gods of our generation. Our world is governed by the one just God, is now and ever shall be, world without end. The gift given to us by these scribes is the permission to connect these words of God, the word of God, these psalms, with specific seasons and memorable moments in our life as well. Thankful for the gift of the ancient scribes, locating these words in one man's life, we too now are to locate them in ours. This will require effort and discipline, daily, I think. This will require the acknowledgement of evil and injustice in the human heart and society. This will require the affirmation of a truly just God who will by no means clear the guilty. And this will require the announcement of the gospel. We are saved from the wrath of God by his grace. We are saved from the injustice of this world by his mercy. We are saved. And this gospel is for the world. Do you believe it? Will you pray it? Let us pray. Jesus, our Savior, who suffered the world's injustice on behalf of the unjust and who was wounded that we may be healed. Give us such courage in the face of injustice to recognize it and name it. Give us such faith in you to recognize your face amidst the evil and call on your name. May we hide no sin from your eyes by our timid prayers that do not trust your cross to be the act of the just one. May we withhold no pain from your touch by our silence that does not speak of your healing in our world of hurt. We who have groaned in solitude now seek the blessing of the fellowship of your sufferings, that we may sing and say with the ancients, 
without shame or shyness. You have delivered me from all my troubles, and my eyes have looked in triumph on my foes. O oh God, our help, help us. <laughs> 